All right, so this is now our first non-me example. <laughs> I would not be feeling very well with this, just me. Uh -huh. So first of all, look at about the white space you see in my peripheral smear. And I run with the hemoglobin around 14. Okay. You mean the white space between red cells, Between huh? okay. red cells. So a lot lower here. They're a really lot spaced lower out. There. They're really, really spaced out. And you'll notice that there are some red blood cells that have that donut-like appearance, but there are some that have lost their central pallor completely. Yeah, just a round ball, basically. There are little huh? round balls, and I've sort of highlighted some of them. So this hemoglobin is 7.7, .7, so it's low. And what's the, what's the lower end of the normal range? Well, that depends. Okay. It, it depends if you're what age you are, mm -hmm. and it depends if you're male or female. Okay. Uh, so the lower end of normal for an adult male is, uh, and it well, de depends from lab to lab too, right? It to also, some degree. Yes, mm -hmm. it does. Um, but twelve-ish, something in 12 that range. Yeah. The so seven is pretty under, low. The male uh, hemoglobin is about a gram higher than female. Oh, okay. And so yeah, so seven point seven is going to be low. It's not quite at transfusion low yet. Okay. That's usually the low seven, or if you have um, like coronary artery disease and are symptomatic, then uh -huh. they might give you some. So all the black arrows are pointing to those cells I described that had lost their central pallor. And um, are those spherocytes? Those are spherocytes. Because they're a sphere? Okay, yeah. cool. And the blue one, if you look really, really closely, you can see some fine basophilic skin. Yeah, it has little is, dots. Which is why it got its own little special color. <laughs> so uh, this patient doesn't have a history of hereditary spherocytosis. Okay. And if she did, I would expect pretty much all of them to look like spherocytes. Um, so this is probably going to be an autoimmune type hemolysis. And um, that, I mean, that's probably what this is. But and is that like the you get antibodies attached to the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, and then the spleen we, pulls off little bits of membrane and it makes them lose membranes so they turn instead of a biconcave disc into a sphere? Right, because it's I the vaguely same remember this from yeah, med school. It's, it's, a long it's sort time. of like the fluid kind of stays about the same and you're taking away your membrane. Uh -huh. So then it turns them into spheres and then they can't bend through the capillaries. Uh -huh. So they lice. break and rupture and lice. Oh, and that's then bad. You, yeah. Okay. And then you don't have functioning red cells uh -huh. anymore. Okay. Uh, so in hereditary spherocytosis, where all the red blood cells are spheres, a lot of patients end up getting splenectomies uh -huh. to help with the whole To process. avoid that problem. Okay. Um, that and their spleens get rather large, trying to take out all the spherocytes. So oh, okay. Uh, they, hereditary spherocytosis is a chronic hereditary or a chronic hemolytic, hemolytic condition. And so you're going to still get hemolysis as you're not taking out all your capillaries. I mean, you need those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least your spleen isn't, like, holding on to them yeah. anymore. And I always have problems remembering, like, which mutation is more common in hereditary spherocytosis versus hereditary elliptocytosis. And it's ancrin for spherocytosis, and it's spectrin for elliptocytosis. So the S's don't stay together. Ah, uh, yeah. I always have to use unusual tricks like that to help me remember uh, things I get confused a lot. And or look that up five minutes before you take the test and then forget. <laughs> uh. That's what I do with the coag cascade and compliment. I can't ever remember it. I have to look it up before every exam. I can yeah. never get the stick. So for this, you'd probably check a DAT to see if your DAT was positive. And DAT is uh, like a Coombs test, right? Right. Basically. So it's checking to see if there's antibodies on the red cells? Right. Okay, cool. This was a very interesting case that we had. So you'll notice that there are red cells and a few platelets, but like no white cells in this picture at all. Yeah. And it turns out this patient actually came to us for pancytopenia, and she was in almost 70 years old, had no real medical history of anything, uh, no history of anemia, no nothing. And it turns out her pancytopenia spontaneously resolved. So it was probably actually hmm. a viral insult. But it prompted this whole workup for MDS. And it turns out she actually had all her life hereditary elliptocytosis and never knew it. Never knew. So unlike hereditary spherocytosis, where you have all these problems with hemolysis, 
You don't generally get that with hereditary elliptocytosis. So you could have it your whole life and be asymptomatic, basically. And then, until someone happens to look at your blood and say, oh, look, they're all ovals. Yeah. And that happens often. Now, I'm not saying that happens all the time because some patients do have problems mm -hmm. with hemolysis, but a lot of times it presents sort of like this. And then the black arrow is pointing not at an elliptocyte, which are these guys here. Those are elliptocytes, okay. But what's, yeah, what's the but spiky that, guy? Exactly. Uh, it's also called a burr cell. Ah, okay. Or an echinocyte. Oh, like a hedgehog, like right? Like a hedgehog, spiky. yes. And it, was that on the last slide, too? The last, I, thought, I saw spiky cells Probably. there. Probably. Is that the same? And, and I'll tell you why. Because often when we get these slides made for our study sets, they've sat for a few hours. Oh. And it kind of like change happens as the red cells sit and, uh, and or other processes such as uremia. And this patient did not have uremia. Okay. So Most, sometimes they're real and sometimes they're artifact, but the... So you have to look at the whole clinical picture to make, whole, see which makes sense. When I'm seeing a lot of echinocytes, I always check the chemistry. And okay. if the BUN creatinine is high, then I will specifically comment on that. Okay, perfect. If I know that this is an add-on order and the BUN creatinine is normal, um, I may or may not comment on them depending on how prominent they are. So I'm just going to interject here. This is an awesome example of how pathology, although we do a lot of looking at pictures and images and microscopic uh, findings, we're doctors. We have to put together the whole picture, the clinical, the other lab work, see if what we're seeing makes sense and interpret it with that lens, right? We, we're not just like saying, oh, here's the findings. Good luck uh, to our clinical team. We, we work with them and with all of the aspects of what the patient has to try to figure out what makes the most sense of what's going on, right? right. And it's that, that kind of problem solving, some days it's maddening because it's hard, but it also is cool when you find a find an answer that makes sense and you can actually make a difference for a patient. I, those are moments I really like at least. So, Some of the times you get the most words from me when I have absolutely no clinical history. I th yes, <laughs> me too. Because I don't know what's going on. So you get a lot of, like it could be all of this umbrella thing, I don't know anything so you're going to have to go back to the patient and figure out so dear clinical colleagues who are watching this please help your pathologists out help us help you tell us clinical information about the patient because we are we are able to often give you more information back when we know more about what's going on um and that's that's everyone wins right i've encountered and i'm sure you have too bias where the clinical colleagues think they're going to to bias us <laughs> and what we're going to say if they give us pertinent information and that's really not true we're yeah better able to help if we have more yeah and we we train to to work around that right i actually always try to look at slides first without seeing see what i what i see and without knowing any clinical then i look at the clinical afterwards and see does it make sense what i saw microscopically and then what the clinical situation is and if it does that's great if it doesn't then i go and rethink the situation so it's good